My name is Wayne Snyder. I'm a member of the Computer Science Department and a faculty in residence in Rich Hall. Uh, and welcome to our third TED, or uh, RET talk, sorry, <laughs> which is BU's version of the TED talks that you've, you've heard. And it gives, uh, it gives uh, students and faculty a chance to meet together, uh, talk about common interests. And it has a rather unique format. So we'll have three speakers who will give short talks and then there'll be time for question and answer between and refreshments at the end, of course. And um, uh, the question and answer, I've been asked to tell you when, when we start that, uh, there'll be a microphone that'll go around and wait till it comes around because we want to record your questions for posterity. So our first speaker uh, I'm pleased to present is Nathan Phillips, who I've known for years in the core curriculum. We've worked together. He is uh, director of the Sustainable Neighborhood. I should talk into the microphone and take my own advice, don't you think? Uh, he's the director of the Sustainable Neighborhood Lab and a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment. His areas of interest include global change biology, tree physiology, and the structure and function of resilient resource distribution systems, human or natural. Nathan? Thank you, Wayne. It's, it's a real pleasure to share some of my research with you. And I want to tell you a bit about Boston as an ecosystem. And I'm an ecologist, but I've developed over the years to go from studying uh, ecology in what we might call the wild places out in central Massachusetts or Ecuador or uh, the hinterlands in Sweden to uh, here at Boston looking at the ecology in Boston, and more recently, the ecology of Boston, uh, thinking about this, this city as a coupled system. It's not just about the trees in Boston. It's about how they interact with us. The trees are breathing in the CO2. We're breathing out the carbon dioxide, the fully interactive ecosystem that we're part of here. And I am a forest ecologist, and trees are uh, as Wayne introduced me, I'm a tree physiologist at heart. I think about how trees function, and that provides a lens for me to think about Boston as, as a system. When I look at the road networks, I'm thinking of the tree venation in the leaves and comparing and contrasting those systems. And it's been a really interesting way for me to think about how we're doing in Boston with regards to sustainability, with regards uh, to resilience. And so, when, we think of, when I think about trees, I think about how synced the systems in a tree are. The carbon system is talking to the water system. Um, it's a finely integrated uh, system, a physiological system. Uh, and so this is something then when I look at Boston, I think about how the infrastructure systems work in, in, in this city. I also think about trees and forests in the way they breathe. Uh, take up the carbon dioxide and respire it back as well. Uh, and so one of our projects here at Boston University we call urban metabolism. We're using the, the metaphor of an organism to think about the flows of matter and energy in the city. And so if you ever get a chance, you can join me on the roof of uh, the CAS building where we have what I call our urban metabolism meter. It's measuring the real-time carbon footprint of the city of Boston 24-7. And we have that sensor there matched up with uh, a sensor right on the top of the Prudential Building, one of the two tallest buildings in the city of Boston, as well as partners uh, in, at UMass Boston, out at Harvard Forest. And we're really getting a sense for the pulse of the city, if you will, or its breathing. And we found some really amazing results. Like in the weekends, there's a different breathing pattern of the city with regards to its CO2 respiration than during the weekdays as, as people are uh, massively reorganized in space and time from the rush hour kind of rhythm of life to the weekends where we don't have that. We see that show up as kind of the signature of Boston's carbon metabolism. But what I want to talk a little bit more in depth about here today is, is about the structure of Boston's uh, what we call infrastructure ecology. Okay? And so 
what we know as ecologists is that structure and function go together very well. Okay, the, the way a tree is structured really informs the way it functions, okay? And so when we uh, look at Boston, for example, we think about uh, a kind of infrastructure ecology. If you think about it, our road networks, our gas pipelines, our electrical systems, our communication systems are largely co-located uh, along the, the same roadways. They're either under the street, above the street, or the street itself, okay? What I learned about three years ago uh, really was eye-opening to me uh, about how Boston functions and how many other major cities function. And this was really a case of serendipity in science. I've come to believe that happenstance and circumstance really uh, can change the direction our research goes in. So about two blocks from my home in Newton, I was walking uh, down the street on a week weekend with my young son and we happened to meet a person, uh, his name is Bob Ackley, uh, who was measuring natural gas leaks uh, in the lawn of a house. Again, two blocks away from my ho home. And since he was on a lawn and he was next to a tree, as a tree physiologist, I had to ask, what are you doing? And so he, he uh, explained to me how he was measuring this invisible gas coming out of the soil that was from a leaking gas pipeline. And so for me, I was instantly hooked because he said it damages trees, okay? And being a tree physiologist, I started thinking, well, exactly what's happening? Is it the root membranes? What, is it a failure of the water system? What's going on here? And that was the gateway for me to get involved in research um, that ultimately led to us mapping the pipeline leaks throughout the entire city of Boston where we discovered over 3,000 of these natural gas leaks in the distribution pipeline system of Boston. Okay? And there's a whole other story associated with that about the greenhouse gas implications, the climate Im implications, uh, even explosions in houses. I never ever thought that my research would take me into the direction where it would have anything to do with you know, explosions happening or manhole covers flying off, um, that kind of thing. Um, and yet what I found uh, about this infrastructure uh, was really uh, telling about how our city works in comparison to how I think about how trees work. Okay, so as we were driving the streets of Boston, measuring all of, all of these uh, gas leaks, we noticed uh, things about the other infrastructures, okay? And we noticed things like on Main Street in Charlestown, how a brand new paved street was paved right over a 100-year-old leaking pipeline, okay? Or Center Street in Roslindale, where there was new pavement about a year ago, and then patches very soon after the new pavement went down to repair uh, leaking uh, gas lines. And if you know, if you've been here uh, 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 over a year or so, you'll know that patches on pavement seed potholes. Okay, so it, you don't, don't really want to be uh, digging up streets after they've just been paved. And so there were numerous examples like that. It still happens today, just in Newton, Newton where I live, next to the Newton Library, new pavement, again, over a leaking gas pipeline. Other things like the conflict between these gas pipes and what we call our green infrastructure, the trees. So um, municipalities planting brand new trees, saplings, in wells where there's gas leaking, okay? Um, and so there, what we came to find really is that the systems of infrastructure in Boston aren't really operating in a harmonious uh, manner the way they do in a well-functioning tree or a well-functioning human uh, physiological system. These systems aren't talking to each other. The infrastructures are siloed in the way that we manage them and we're losing lots of money um, by losing the opportunity that when the road is dug up to replace a sewer line, if you know that there's a leaking gas pipe, that's the time to fix it. That's the time where, in which you can save a, a lot of money. Um, and so that's a challenge for us. We've come to, you know, I've come to learn that laid on top of this infrastructure ecology, okay, this physical set of systems that are co-located and should be synced, but they're not, 
is an entire political ecology which represents the stakeholders, the municipalities, the utilities, the different agencies that are responsible for our infrastructure. And the problem is not a technical problem, it's a human problem where these agencies and stakeholders, they aren't communicating. And there are barriers, there are active barriers uh, for those uh, different stakeholders to be communicating in such a way that we treat our infrastructure and maintain it in, in a kind of coordinated uh, fashion. And so from that experience and what, we, what I've learned about the, the infrastructure ecology of Boston, we've started to do some very simple things um, to, to try to improve the situation. Uh, and one, it, it's quite really amazing, is we've just been, with a PhD student of mine, Margaret Hendrick and myself, we've been looking on the web at different municip municipalities and their road paving schedule, okay? And we match that up with the age of the pipelines under the streets. And from my experience in Newton, I've astounded myself that the, the uh, city manager didn't know this. So what we're doing is we're using the resources that are available on the web publicly to connect the dots, to, to make linkages um, that are allowing municipalities to see those links uh, and to bring others together like the, the utilities to address these issues. So the fact that we're able to do it on kind of an ad hoc basis now, to me, proves that it can be done. It, it doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy uh, thing to have our cities work in a more uh, integrated uh, fashion, but it's definitely doable, okay? And so I continue to use the, the kind of tree as a lens for thinking about uh, Boston and its urban uh, ecology uh, as, an, as an integrated uh, ecosystem. And in, in a larger sense, I think about comparing and contrasting you know, us here in this room as residents of Boston and where we live um, to a tree. If you think about a tree, it's a network too. It, it, it delivers uh, water to the leaves and nutrients to the leaves and it takes in CO2 from the, the leaves and feeds that organism, okay? So if you think about the terminal points on that network of a tree, the leaves, they're in a way you can think of them like the houses in our cities, they're the terminal points. But those leaves are, they're consuming things from the entirety of the infrastructure, but they're also producers, they're giving back to the system. And I think that's one major difference by and large with our society is that at the end points of our infrastructure system, we're consumers, by and large we're basically consumers of resources, okay? And I think that our biggest challenge uh, going forward is to flip that. Uh, it, we're always going to be consumers. We're not plants. We don't photosynthesize. But to, to, to transform these endpoints of consumption into points of production, okay? And we have the technology to do that. We are able to use distributed uh, generation of solar uh, power and wind energy um, to actually create infrastructure networks that are sharing and giving back to our cities as much as we are taking from them. Um, and so I will just end there and ask for your questions. I'll be around afterwards to take I I individual questions too. Yeah. Or. I just, uh, it's a little off the topic of the main thrust, but how how are the trees in Boston surviving? And are they, I can't, I mean, they take in carbon dioxide, which we produce quite a lot of. Yeah. Um, are they healthy? I mean, are they, is this a, I imagine that, that it would not be a healthy environment. Trees can be incredibly resilient. And so they, they can also be very vulnerable. Uh, it's a really interesting question. There's one tree that does really good well. It's uh, the tree that was written about in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, 
uh, which is the Alanthus tree, which is all over the BU campus. It's a, it's a so-called invasive tree from China, and it just grows like gangbusters. It is able to take all of the resources, the CO2, uh, and put it into growth. And it's a really good question as to whether it's actually offering ecosystem services that are value, valuable to us, and I think it is, uh, versus is it displacing a native species that would be here, so. Uh, but are, are there other things that are dangerous to the trees, or are they? Yes, and in fact, that's been a reason. It, it, it clouds the issue of the gas leak effect on the trees because trees die for many reasons, salt spray, mechanical damage, construction, and, you know, it kind of, there's a lot of things that can damage the urban green infrastructure. So. Yeah, you mentioned earlier in the beginning of the talk that during the weekend we have a different pattern of CO2 in, in the general um, atmosphere of Boston, uh, the spirit of Boston. How does that affect the physiology of the trees? Have you seen any um, adaptability changes over the years or something? That's a on? really good question. Uh, and I don't know the exact answer to that, but there's reason to believe that it does have an impact. And if there's a, the rule rather than the exception in ecology is that uh, the response of plants to the environment is non-linear, not linear. What that means is that you can't just average up over time the annual carbon emissions of us humans in our built environment and then kind of say, okay, plants, what do you do with this? You have to take the time-by-time -time interaction of the trees, like a 9 a.m., an 8 a.m. on a rush hour when all of the cars are spewing CO2, the trees are interacting in real time uh, in a way that you need to capture that interaction. And then if you want to aggregate that interaction up over time, you can do that. But it, 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 there is reason to believe that uh, the, the kinds of pulses of CO2 that we're putting out, our biorhythms, our human biorhythms, are, should have an effect on the plants. Okay, thank you.